I said to you week after week, the, the essence of recovery is walking in relationship with God. That is the heartbeat of recovery, is walking in a relationship with God. And the central way that we build a relationship with God is by knowing who God is. And God has revealed himself through Jesus Christ. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Meaning this, that everything that the Father is, I am revealing to you because Jesus is God's Son. Jesus is the exact imprint of his nature. He is the manifestation of God the Father in heaven. And so the most important thing we can do with this short time I have with you to talk to you on Sunday nights is to tell you about Jesus. Is to just look at his life, press in to his truth. So look at Mark chapter 1. Verse 21 to 28. Here's what you're going to see in this passage. Jesus enters into a synagogue. It's just like a little church. And he does so to teach. And his purpose is to teach the Bible. But when he's there in the synagogue, there's a man among the congregation who has a demon within him. He's possessed by a demon. And Jesus has the authority to cast that demon out. And what I want you to see in this passage overall is the authority of Jesus Christ. That Jesus Christ has full authority now and forever. And that includes every single one of our lives. So look with me at the word of God. It says, And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come here to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. And they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region in Galilee. Let's pray together. Our Father and our God, we come to your word tonight to learn more about Jesus. We know, Lord, it's because he lives that we can face tomorrow. It's because he has died and he has been raised from the dead that we have hope beyond the grave. We may not know what tomorrow holds, but we know the one who holds tomorrow. You're sovereign over all things. And we don't need to fear anymore, Lord. We don't need to live in fear if we know Christ and follow him. Because in Christ, there's freedom and there's joy and there's power to live a new life. And so I want to pray for every person here tonight that you would grant them the power they need in Christ to live a new life. And I want to pray that you would illuminate the scriptures to teach us more about who you are. Because in our recovery, Lord... Whatever sin we are battling, you are the one who has power to help us overcome. So help me to teach your word now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. As I said, this this section, really Mark chapter 1 as a whole, is all about the authority of Christ. And even as I say that, I realize that word, authority, is not one we like. Right? No one likes authority. When I was pastoring in Indiana, a man from my congregation came to me and he said, Pastor Brandon, will you, will you go visit my son? He's, he's in the Shelby County Jail. I said, absolutely, I'll go in there, I'll see him the next time I go in. So I go to the jail and I go to see this young man and he's, he's doing really well. He's reading the Bible, he's praying, he's talking about how he wants to live differently. He's getting ready to be sent off to prison and he wanted to change his life. And I was really, I was really optimistic about him. But then when I left that day, I was walking out, and one of the jailers said, oh, man, he's one of the worst ones we have. He, he's constantly rebellious. We have to lock him down all the time. He's always cussing out the jailers. And I know none of y'all ever did that. And he said that he's just one of our hardest to deal with. I said, all right. So the next time I went to visit him, I asked him, I said, Are you, is it true that you're really disrespectful to the guards? He admitted, yeah, I am. He acted like it was no big deal. I said, do you realize that it's going to be nearly impossible to build a relationship with God if you are constantly defying the authorities over you? He said, well, what do you mean? 
I said, the Bible teaches that God has placed people over us in different spheres of life as authority figures. Romans 13 tells us that God has appointed the government. So that would include people like police officers, jailers, probation officers. These people, whether or not they're good or bad, God has appointed them and uses them as his authority. And if you're going to defy the authority in your life, you're ultimately, you're defying God. He looked shocked when I told him that. Listen, I'm not here to talk about Romans 13 and whether you need to obey the governing authorities in your life. You should, you really should. If you're trying to live a new life, and just this is a side note, you need to obey your boss. You need to obey your house manager. You need to obey your pastors. You need to obey the people that are over you in the Lord. But that's not what I want to talk to you about. What I want to talk to you about is that as, as fallen sinners, we naturally buck authority. As fallen individuals, we do not like authority. We don't want authority. And when people try to exercise authority over us, there's this natural inclination. Is There's a natural resistance within us that says, I don't want you to tell me what to do. It started with our parents. And then it went on to our teachers, and then it went to police officers and jailers and probation officers and POs and every person after that, bosses and the like. We don't like authority, ultimately, because here's why. Here's why we don't like people in authority over us. We don't want God to be in authority over us. We don't want anyone telling us what to do, and that includes God himself. When Adam and Eve were in the garden, what was their sin? What did Satan tell them would happen if they ate from the fruit? You'll become like God. In other words, you will be the ruler of your life. And that's what every man and every woman has wanted from that very moment. And here's what I want you to understand that's absolutely crucial. And whether or not you call yourself a Christian or a Buddhist or whatever it is you are, this applies to you. Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is the sovereign king over the entire universe because God has made him so. Jesus Christ came, lived an absolutely perfect life. He was killed upon the cross just as God told him to do. Then God raised him from the dead and he ascended back to heaven. And Jesus Christ right now is ruling and reigning at the right hand of God as the absolute monarch over everything. And he calls us right now in this short life that we have to bow the knee to him. To submit to him as ruler and king. And here's what happens when we do that. We find the purpose for our existence. When we bow the knee to Jesus Christ, we find in him fullness of joy and, and happiness and satisfaction. We find fulfillment in our lives. That's when fear goes away. That's when power enters into our lives to live. Because, listen, you were not made to live in rebellion against God. You were made to live underneath his kingship and authority. And as he rules in your life, he's a good and gracious ruler and your life will flourish underneath his authority but it's when you step out from underneath that authority that's when life gets chaotic just to give you a simple simple illustration you don't have to raise your hand but how many of you have gotten sober before entered into the church and recovery and you're reading the bible and you're praying and things got better right and then you removed yourself from that place of authority back to your own authority and life became chaotic really quick. That's because when you live against the purpose of your existence, which is to know, love, and serve Jesus Christ, sin will dominate you. Sin will dominate you. And tonight what I want you to see is that Jesus Christ has all authority and we should submit to him. That's it. That's all I want you to see from the scripture. So look with me. Start at verse 21. We've seen at this point, we've been studying the gospel of Mark. Jesus was baptized. He was anointed as the king, filled and anointed with God's spirit. He then went into the desert where he defeated Satan, showing that he, he is not 
going to fall like Adam did. Adam fell in the garden. The second Adam, Jesus Christ, had victory. So then he came into Galilee proclaiming the kingdom has come, repent and believe the gospel because the king is not only victorious, he's recruiting people into his kingdom. And we saw that last week when he called the fishermen, Peter, James, John, Andrew, to to leave their lives and follow him. Now he's going to demonstrate his authority through his words and over demons, or you could call it his judgments. Let's look at them one at a time. Let's look first at the authority of Jesus' words. Or the, the authoritative words of Christ. Look at verse 21. Everybody take your paper and look at it with me. If you don't have one, share with a friend next to you. It says, and they, that's Jesus and his four disciples at this point. It says, they went into Capernaum. This is where Peter lived. Jesus relocates here. And immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and he was teaching. So here, here's what you have to understand about the Bible. Because I hope you're reading the Bible. I hope that you're going through the Gospels. And you're, you're reading things like this, things like synagogue and, and Jesus' teaching. And, and you notice that there's this temple in Jerusalem. It's where the sacrifices were made. It's where all the, the main events happen. And then there's all these little local synagogues. That's because during this time, the majority of the people would go to Jerusalem to worship at the feast. But during the week, they would stay in their hometowns go to these synagogues. They're like little churches. And they would go on the Sabbath, which was a Saturday. So Jesus, every Saturday, Jesus would go into these synagogues, like little churches, and he would teach the Bible. That was his custom. It was a very normal thing for Jesus to do. What was uncommon was how he taught the Bible. Look at verse 22. As Jesus teaches the Bible, it says they were astonished at his teaching. That word astonished is used elsewhere to describe how people respond when Jesus raises individuals from the dead. Their their mind is blown from this teaching because he's teaching them as one who has authority, not like their scribes. So when Jesus teaches the Bible, he's teaching them with power and conviction and clarity like, like, like no one they've ever heard before. That's how Jesus teaches the Bible. And the people are just, they're blown away by this because they heard Bible teaching all the time. They would have rabbis and scribes, those were the religious leaders. They would come by on a Saturday as well. They would teach, but they weren't very authoritative. They weren't, they weren't compelling because they're always saying what some other guy said. But when Jesus came in, he would say, thus says the Lord. He would say exactly what the Bible says. And here's why it was so unique. Listen, Jesus is speaking from the authoritative word of God because he is the God of the word. He's testifying of the Lord because he is the Lord. They're literally hearing God in the flesh teach his own words. He's the one who authored the scriptures and they're blown away by it. When I first became a Christian, I got into a a discipleship group with a guy. His name was John. And we would read, read the scripture on our own. Then we would meet like McDonald's or something. And we would talk about it. And I just remember one time, I think it was the first time really I ever read the Bible after I got saved. I remember reading the gospel of Matthew, reading the words of Jesus, and I was just blown away. When I read, when Jesus would say, you've heard it was said, but I say to you, you know, you you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you, you shall not even lust after a woman lest you commit adultery in your heart. His words were so powerful and compelling and transformational to me. They were were relative, relevant rather, and they were authoritative. That's the words of Christ today. When we open this book called the Bible, these are the very words of God. These are, if you will read it and understand it and believe it, this book has the power to change your life. The word of God can change anyone's heart. The hardest of hearts. It was the word of God through which the heavens were made. Imagine what it can do in your life. If you'll pick it up this week and you'll read it and you'll study it. And maybe give a little less time to the screen. And a little bit more time to his word. 
How many of you know we could all benefit from that? Maybe a little more time in prayer this week. A little more time reading the scriptures to get to know this God that we're trying to follow. This is where you'll get to know him, is in his word. And listen, he will meet you through his word. He will speak to you through his word. If you're listening. If you're listening. So those are the authoritative words of Christ. Next, I want to show you the authoritative judgments of Christ. Because what we see here is Christ passing judgment on a demon. It says in verse 23, And immediately there was in the synagogue, their synagogue, a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come here to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. So as Jesus is preaching, I mean, imagine in this congregation right now as as I'm preaching, some man just starts just crying out. And I'm not talking about just yelling. I mean, this guy is crazy. He's screaming at the top of his lungs. His voice is different than they're used to hearing from this guy. And immediately Jesus knows this man is demon possessed. Now listen, I know we live in 2021 United States of America and, and we don't we don't believe in these things anymore. We're we're so advanced intellectually that we've gotten past the ideas of angels and demons and such. But here's what the Bible teaches. We live not only in a physical world that God has created, we also live in a spiritual world. A spiritual world that if God were to rip back the veil and allow you to see it, is full of angels and demons. I think a lot of times the things we classify as certain problems in people's lives may not always be mental problems. In many cases, they are spiritual problems. The Bible teaches that God created all things good. He created angels, but a third of them fell from heaven, including Satan. And now those particular fallen angels are demons. The Old Testament speaks about demonic possession once or twice. The book of Acts, once or twice. The Gospels are full of them. Because as one writer put it, when Jesus came on the scene, literally all hell broke loose. When they, when they see Jesus, this is what happened every single time a demon sees Jesus. They're absolutely terrified. It's never the opposite way. Jesus is never terrified of them. They never stand toe-to-toe with him. It's never an equal match. They're always terrified of the Son of God. And listen, demons in the Bible are no joke. There's just one story in Acts chapter 19 where this man comes preaching in the name of Jesus. And the demons are so powerful that they're able to physically assault and beat up seven men. One man who's possessed by a demon is able to take down seven men. That's how powerful they were. Jude tells us that the archangel Michael was not strong enough to stand up against the devil. So angels and demons and fallen angels, they are, they are not anything to play with. But here's what we see in the Gospels. They are no match for Jesus Christ. They're no match for the Son of God. That's why if you look back at it, it says, have you come here to destroy us? They're saying it's not the time, is it? But what time? The day of judgment. Is is this the day? Has the time come for you to to cast us into hell? Because listen, they know that there is a day coming where Jesus, with his word, will say, go to the lake of fire forever, and they will go immediately and eternally. And they're saying, is it that day? It's not that day. But Jesus shows them that that day is coming, and they won't be able to do anything about it. Look at verse 25. Jesus rebuked them, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsing and crying out with a loud voice came out of him. He gave him two commands, Be quiet and get out. And the demon did exactly what Jesus said, not because he wanted to, because he had to. He had no choice. Listen, are you seeing the authority of Jesus Christ here? Do you realize that this same Christ, who with a word casts out demons is the same Christ you will one day see face to face. Everybody in here will see him face to face. 
And you will either see him with great joy and excitement because you have been longing to see him as your savior and your Lord. And then that moment, you will be like him or you will see him in that moment and be terrified. Absolute horror. Because he will face you as judge. Which is why in this moment, as you still have the ability to draw breath into your lungs, you have the opportunity to have your sins forgiven and granted eternal life. If you will believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins and that God raised him from the dead and you will call upon the name of the Lord right now, you will be saved. If you will cry out and say, Lord Jesus, save me from your judgments, forgive me of my sins, I believe in you, he will draw near to you even in this moment. Friends, listen, we we want you to come here to Recovery and Redemption at the Journey Church and And we want to help you in your sobriety and your walk to fight sin every single day. But you know what we want for you more than anything? Your salvation. We want you to be able to stand before the Lord with confidence and not in horror. And you can do that through Christ. Well, at the end of the story here, they're all amazed. His teaching, his ability to command unclean spirits, they just can't believe it. And from that point, and from this point in Mark's gospel, the fame of Jesus Christ spreads everywhere. Before we close, let me just ask the question and answer it really quickly. What can we learn from this passage? What can we take away, apply to our lives from this text of scripture? I just want to give you three very brief things by way of application. Number one is this. Without Jesus, you are bound to be led astray. Without Jesus, you're bound to be led astray. Why do I say that? Because one of the clear points of this passage is that Jesus has authoritative words. His words carry weight and power. And the reality is, is that right now, at this very moment, every single man and woman in this building, you are living by some forms of authority. You're living under someone's authority for life. And it's either going to be God's authority or it's going to be your authority. Either you're letting God run your life or you are calling the shots. And if you're the one calling the shots, then you are going to be open to a lot of influence from the world and a lot of lies from the devil. Because our thinking is very wishy-washy at best. And when our thinking and our belief systems aren't grounded and built upon the solid rock and the authoritative word of God, then you're going to be bound to believe anything. And most likely you're going to believe things that you think benefits you, but in the long run lead to your destruction. Which is why today the most important thing you can do is begin to build your life upon this To base everything you believe and think and do upon this book. Get into the Bible. Learn the words of Jesus so that you can be under his authority. Second thing I want to share with you is that without Jesus, you will be open to Satan's devastating assaults. His devastating assaults. If you're here tonight and you're a Christian, you are not immune to temptation. You are not invincible against the devil's schemes. Now, here's what I will tell you. I do not believe scripture teaches any man or woman who knows Christ can be possessed by a demon. Why? Because you have the Holy Spirit. No unclean spirit can enter where the Holy Spirit is. But beware because Satan's temptations are real and they are effective even in the life of the believer. But listen, if you're not a Christian here tonight... I don't know what other conclusion to come to when I read the Bible than this, that you are open to the full assault of the devil. Now this may sound like religious talk to you, but I can assure you we do not live in merely a physical time and space world. This is a spiritual world, and if you don't know Christ, then you are open to satanic and demonic power. And I'm telling you, Satan wants nothing more than to ruin your life. He wants to keep you addicted. He wants to keep you incarcerated. He wants to keep you having 
terrible thoughts. He wants to keep you from your family. He wants to keep you depressed and anxious and fearful. And Christ offers the opposite of all of that. Christ offers you love and power and freedom and joy. He offers you hope. He offers you self-control. He did not give us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and self-control, the Bible says. And if you're not in Christ, you are open to all kinds of darkness. So it brings me to my last point, which sums it all up. Submit to Jesus' authority daily. Every single day. Paul said, I die to myself daily. What does he mean? I die to my wants. I die to my desires. I die to my wishes. I, I submit myself to the authority of Christ who, who is worthy. Guys, listen, he's worthy. He's worthy of your obedience. He's worthy of your worship. He's worthy for you to say, my Lord and my God. And, and listen, you're either living in submission to him or you are a rebel tonight. You're either living underneath his lordship or you're the God of your life. And listen, we make terrible gods. We are terrible at running our own lives. That's why I say all the time, you know what the first thing you got to do when you get into recovery? Not only admit you have a problem, it's time to fire the manager. Because you've done a poor job. I did a poor job managing this company called Brand Sutton Incorporated. I almost bankrupted it and ran it into the ground until Jesus came in. Until Jesus absolutely changed my life forever. I don't, I don't stand up here and preach these things and beg you, literally beg you and plead with you to come to Christ because they pay me to do it. Or because I like to hear myself talk. The worst thing in the world is for me to have to watch one of my own sermons. It's a judgment on my soul. I say these things to you because I desperately want you to know Christ. I desperately want you to give your life to Christ so that you will not only live a free life now, but you won't have to face the judgment later. Give yourself to him every single day. Submit yourself to him because Jesus is Lord.